Good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad to be with you for the third roundtable of today's, uh, today's day organized with the, uh, the school Aremetier uh, Paris Tech uh, in coordination with the Open Diplomacy Institute. Um, so we, we will be uh, talking about a, a, quite, a, a quite challenging topic, uh, innovation, innovation towards uh, the future we want with some expert personalities that are here uh, in Paris or, uh, or acting and speaking uh, remotely. So uh, I would like to welcome uh, here Manish Tewari, uh, who is an MP uh, in, uh, in India and a former, in, former minister of uh, innovation and telecommunication of the uh, Indian Union. Um, Yassin Aid Kasi, who is the founder and the strategy director at the Fond uh, Elix Foundation in, French, in France. Um, Professor Denis Guibard, Uh, who is uh, the general director for the uh, Min Telecom Business School Institute and also uh, a chair, uh, chairman of the uh, sustainable uh, committee at the um, Grand École Committee, who is uh, uh, a, panel, uh, a panel organizing uh, Grand École uh, in France. Um, so here in Paris, and we also have remotely uh, Dr. Thel Krug, who is uh, vice chairman of the IPCC. Um, and uh, Delphine Jenny Stefan, who is uh, a former uh, industry minister uh, in France. Um, so thank you all for being part of this, uh, of this talk that will be quite challenging since the word innovation is not something uh, easy to, uh, to define and to work about. Um, so I'd like maybe to, uh, to begin with, um, with a, a little definition of, uh, of the innovation and what might innovation be for you, um, and more especially, how can it help smooth or even make possible the current industrial transition, uh, which is the, the topic of today's, uh, today's meetings organized with, uh, with uh, Arémetier Paris Tech. So um, maybe to, to begin uh, with you, uh, Professor Denis Guibard, since, uh, since you are uh, um, um, quite close to the academia and, uh, and the uh, and the, uh, the educational world, uh, work, um, what would be your definition of the innovation today and uh, um, how can it uh, insert itself into uh, the sustainable uh, goals that we want to achieve? Yeah, yes, well, maybe just to, to clarify, I'm not a professor. Ah, okay. I'm working in the academic <laughs> world, but I'm not an academic. Okay. I'm working close to the academic, you know. Uh, but anyway, referring back to your, to your question, uh, it, for me, innovation, It's mainly an idea turned into reality and that is meeting a demand or a market. And, that, and then that is changing things. That's maybe the broadest definition I can give of innovation. And then, of course, uh, innovation can go in various directions. And, and the one we're looking for, especially in this discussion, and if you are looking at the future of the world and our planet, is the, the innovation that will, have, that will have a positive impact. And then we will, I guess it will be part of our discussion, and look at what it means by having a positive impact and how we measure it. And, and that is quite a, a challenge, but maybe just to get started, that might be enough for the definition of, <laughs> my definition of innovation. And so, thank you. Maybe one idea that might be uh, interesting is, since we have a former minister from the Indian Republic and a former minister from the French Republic, how would you translate the idea of innovation into public policies, uh, and more especially in this, uh, in this framework that are the SDGs? Maybe, uh, Mr. Tiwari, you might begin with this. No, thank you very much uh, for having me on this forum. Well, innovation uh, is a fact of life. So if you were to go back into time uh, when the march of civilization starts, uh, each and every action uh, which has been taken in pursuance of that march represents an innovation. For example, if you were to pick up the field of broadcasting, when you moved from uh, the town crier to the drum beater, and from the drum beater, you moved onwards uh, to more mechanized forms of uh, information dissemination. Uh, you, you, you had the printed word first, uh, which is when uh, machinery first started getting used. Uh, you then moved on to radio, you then went on to uh, television and on to social media. So therefore, I'm just picking up one genre. So, mm. so, so the, the march of humanity uh, in each and every genre Uh, represents stages of innovation. Similarly, there have been innovations, innovations in the means of war. So therefore, uh, 
when you moved from, uh, uh, let's say, uh, very primitive weapons uh, to weapons which were made of iron and steel, and uh, of iron, and then you moved uh, onwards uh, to cannons and stuff like that. So innovation actually, I think, is a, is, is, is a very natural progression of for how human beings have shaped their lives and shaped this planet. Hmm. Quite clear. And so maybe uh, Mrs. Jenny Stefan, you, you might give us uh, your, your point of view on this uh, process, uh, this march of humanity, as you said, Mr. Tiwari, uh, on innovation uh, from uh, a European or French perspective. Uh, I would say um, my point of view is really that uh, innovation and innovation to support the SDGs as uh, something a little bit specific, which is to be um, uh, led, to be directed to long-term goals. And it's not uh, always easy for industries, for private companies to take uh, investment decisions because most of the time this kind of innovation requires huge amount of investment. So it's not so easy for them to take these decisions. It's tough choices to be made. And I think the governments need to help frame these long-term goals, help uh, give incentives, get, help give framework uh, to, um, to show the path, to invest in the right direction for the long term, to build, um, to build coalitions, because uh, we sometimes need to have several, several players Several, several countries involved to get to the critical mass and to get to the right technological level. So I think uh, the, the government role is, is quite broad. Quite clear. Th thank you, Mrs. Jenny Stephen. Um, since, since you mentioned the, the idea that the government should uh, participate in, this, uh, in, uh, in implementing this innovation and, uh, and to frame it, what uh, I, I might ask Mr. Uh, Mr. Ayat Kassi, um, how are the, the foundation, the, the firms, and the, the private sector, I would say, in a, in a broader sense, uh, would take a part in this, uh, and especially to coordinate with the governments towards these sustainable goals? Uh, first of all, uh, for me, innovation is transformation. And it's not just technological innovation. You know, when we mm. hear innovation, we think about technology uh, exactly like sustainable development. Some people think about ecology or environment. Uh, innovation is transformation. It means that the sustainable development goals are also an innovation. Uh, and of course, it means that the company has to change the, the, the model and to transform themselves in a very short term. We, we, we talked about the, the long term, but the sustainable goals are for 2030 and uh, we have um, signals of the emergency that uh, that leads this uh, innovation. So it's really, we refer to this, uh, maybe the most important SDG, that is the um, goal 17 about the partnership. And it is very important to have this vision between the private sector and public sector to engage the necessary transformation uh, through innovation because uh, without innovation, we can't, uh, we can't go fast enough. We can change the society with the generational, uh, generational change, but for the goal we face, that is very short, we, defin we des desperately need this uh, build back better innovation with this short term uh, decision that we have to, to take now. Yeah, okay. So th that's quite interesting that you mentioned this uh, innovation timeline uh, because it might be in discordance with uh, the current emergency, as you said, uh, the, the climate emergency, the environmental emergency. And so I, I might uh, ask uh, Mrs. Um, Thelma Krug about this. Since the, uh, the IPCC mentioned timelines that are quite short and uh, that might be um, incompatible with innovation, do you think that we have the time uh, to, uh, to build on, uh, on this innovation, on this process? Or should, or, or should we act right now and uh, not, uh, not uh, um, rely that much on innovation uh, to save us in this uh, climate endeavor? Yes, yeah, thank you very much, uh, 
Jean Baptiste. Yes, indeed. Yeah, you mentioned the the IPCC uh, now pushing for time. Uh, we don't have too much time, and especially for for all sectors of society, industry inclusive. So we are we are thinking about system transitions. Uh, that, for instance, yeah, for the industry, it will encompass a lot of innovation, I would say, but not only. So maybe we have technologies that are available now that could be retrofit, that could be updated, that would not have to rely necessarily on innovation. So when we are talking about 2050, imagine uh, us pushing to net zero globally for CO2 emissions and also pushing for other greenhouse gases to be uh, uh, dramatically reduced. And it's, it's interesting because the IPCC report uh, has assessed in the literature that for the industry, it is possible. It is not uh, completely simply to say that uh, for industry to reach net zero is fantastic. Let's say, for instance, for cement, that has CO2 emissions that you cannot really exclude from the process. So you need like a CCUS um, to cope with that. So uh, I would say that yes, indeed, innovation is gonna be part of us, in particular industry, reaching the net zero globally that we need by 2050. But also I would say that other technologies existing could also be rethought to fit into a new reality. Okay, quite quite clear. So maybe I might uh, I might sum up what what you you said by uh, asking um, an opinion uh, of yours. But do do we rely too much on innovation in the end? Um, I, I might make take the example of uh, of digitization. Uh, since digitization is a quite uh, centralized industry, we might think about the American giants and the uh, Chinese giants the, to that end. And that's something that's quite interesting in the industrial transition. Um, do we rely too much on this innovation and on the people that are already in this innovative path? Uh, how, how might we enter this race or, uh, or f give a framework that would be uh, efficient enough to, uh, to, benefit, uh, to benefit from this? Um, yeah, maybe, maybe again. Uh, well, I I think one of is it, yeah one of the key points is what you mentioned. Innovation is not only technological innovation. There are social innovation. There are process innovation. There are organizational innovation. Uh, there are business model innovation, and we have to rely on all of them, mm. moving in the right direction, to change uh, mainly the way in which we produce, the way in which we consume, and that is what can be used to to achieve this goal and the, 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 the urgency that was pointed out uh, by the IPCC. And, and I think that's the way in which we have to think about innovation. And then the second point, which is very important, is again, to be able to understand what are the impacts. The impact of innovation, uh, of any change, and well, we are in a world of uncertainty and complexity, which means that any technology or any innovation, even if it's not technological, might have positive and negative impacts. And the whole question is first to understand this impact and to also understand how to mitigate or combine this impact and the various innovation. So there is really, a, a, a very, it's very important to think very early when you are in the process of innovation of the impact and possibly building and working on the innovation starting from the idea that innovation has to provide good. Because quite often we try to use an existing technology to make some good things. And they, there are a lot of words and studies about tech for good. Mm. What is more important, and that's something we're studying, for instance, in my own business school, is really good in tech, which means get, start from the good and build the tech or the innovation around this idea. Go the other way around. And that's mm. the way in which it, we, it, we may succeed. But again, be aware of the impact, be aware of the positive and negative impact, look at the systemic approach, and then make your choice regarding innovation, be they technological or not. I think that's the way in which we should, we should proceed. Yeah. But to, to come back on your, on your question, because you, you talk specifically about the digitalization and, and the digital, uh, we just spent one and a half year uh, very strange with this uh, systemic crisis and the, the pandemic. And uh, uh, f from the climate point of view, it's the first time since World War II that we 
we had um, uh, um, a decrease, a decrease yeah. of for uh, emission of GS, yeah, exactly. Uh, and the only thing that maintained the society during this period was the digital that was not made for uh, it, at this moment, and we, we all experience that the, all the, the, the meetings and all the digital. Um, all the, the uh, remote meeting and so on, and uh, we we could go through this, and this is not the the, the, the crisis we could fear bef during the pandemic. Right now, we are starting back, and that's a problem because uh, we we are also also increasing the the emission. But we learned a lot about new ways to maybe create value. And you talked about the centralization on uh, uh, American companies and Chinese companies, but there is right now a very new phenomenon that is all based on decentralization. And it's very interesting also to look at this, not only on the innovation point of view, but also on the, how it could be used to achieve the global goals, because it goes very fast. Uh, and there are a lot of new actors, and uh, it can be also a new framework to, to think about, to, think about, to, uh, to be a, a very helpful for these goals. Hmm. It's really interesting. And you, you mentioned the fact that it's going very fast and that we need a, a common framework. And so that might um, give the question, uh, are we all fit for innovation? And uh, should, we, should we pursue this, uh, this common framework? I would say uh, maybe, Mr. Teori, since you are uh, a minister from a country that is quite strong on, uh, on digitization, uh, from the skills uh, point of view, uh, worker skills, and from the uh, ecosystem, uh, do you think that this common framework uh, might be achieved? after a pandemic that, uh, that um, forced all countries to, uh, to focus on their national uh, and sovereignty uh, uh, goals? Uh, is it something that we might uh, achieve uh, in the framework of innovation? Well, COVID-19 was a disruption and it was an unintended disruption. Digitization was one of the ways that you uh, possibly discovered in order to surmount that disruption. Mm -hmm. But to say that it can become a template for the future, I do not know as to uh, whether that really would be possible. Because uh, there's been a rebound from digitization. Uh, increasingly, uh, as uh, was mentioned, uh, people are opening up, uh, not only because digital means are not available, but primarily because people uh, live in societies and they want to physically meet with each other, they want to uh, see the other person, uh, they want to uh, see the nuances and the smiles and the frowns. So therefore, uh, uh, to that extent, I think there's a great amount of fatigue uh, yeah. with uh, whatever uh, uh, paramateria, uh, Zoom or any of these platforms really <laughs> provided, but there is a larger challenge. You see, every industrial age has come with its own set of challenges. If you rewind back to the first industrial age, when the steam engine uh, came into existence, uh, it uh, had a hugely disruptive effect on society. And uh, therefore, uh, when you had uh, a concentration of uh, factories in urban areas, you had movement of uh, people who came to work in those factories. It ended up creating urban ghettos and brought over it the problem of urbanization. Similarly, the second and the third industrial age came with its own set of challenges. The fourth industrial age, in fact, the one we are in, is going to be extremely complex. And the reason why I say that it's going to be extremely complex is because if you uh, go by a World Bank report in the context of India alone, uh, automation is going to lead to 67% uh, of the jobs in manufacturing alone becoming redundant. So therefore, now if you let's say top up automation with artificial intelligence and robotics and uh, whatever innovations are there in the pipeline, Essentially, what are you going to do with the 8 billion people who inhabit planet Earth? 
So you need to find an alternative paradigm. You need to create an alternative ener uh, economy in order to consume the energies of those people. And uh, uh, in a very different uh, format, we have something uh, called the Progressive Alliance, which is uh, the alliance of progressive political parties around the world. And we've been uh, very extensively working on these alternative frameworks in order to ensure that how do you keep people gainfully employed? For example, one thing that we had come up with was the whole concept of a leisure economy, right? And, 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 and uh, uh, the, the second thing was actually a stay-home economy. Hmm. So essentially, uh, it's not that uh, with automation, people are going to disappear. The, the, <laughs> the, 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 the work which people do may disappear, hmm. but people are going to remain. So how do you deal with that problem? I think hmm. enough attention is not being paid to that. Hmm. Exactly. And you wanted to react? Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, just, just because in history, maybe people are not also uh, made or we maybe don't come on earth to just have a job, but to have a life. And uh, I think these goals can, can go also together because if a machine takes your job, maybe your job is a machine job. And it's a kind of a human challenge we face today because we know we have to slow down on energy, we have to imagine maybe new kind of activities and produce, of course, an economy based on that, May, but maybe not based on industrial jobs. And this is how it changed in the 30 last years uh, in countries, the, the U, um, um, uh, OECD uh, countries and France. And I think it's also a step to go to a more sustainable and less uh, polluting uh, economy. Yeah, that's moving to a dematerialized economy in many respects. But bearing in mind that behind the scene, when it's dematerialized, the, it remains a bit of hardware and a bit of material being used and, and energy being used. So, but that's certainly the, the move we are going to, to see. Again, and we, uh, we were talking about uh, digital world. Digital world can solve a lot of issues, can s make the world keep going, even with all the difficulty you mentioned during a pandemic. But remind, re remember that not everybody is in this digital world. A large amount of the world population is out of it. And so any change we're making based on the digital world has also to, we have also, when we are doing that, take, to take into account that it's not addressing 100% of the population of the planet. That's, that's really interesting. And so I, I think that one underlying thing that you, you mentioned under this is the, um, is the question of trust, um, because there is quite a paradox here, I think. Innovation is a positive word. Uh, that's something that, uh, that unites all of your intervention. Innovation is always seen as something good, but um, there might have uh, some problem of trust with technological, uh, technological advance, which is something uh, uh, quite an under category of innovation, as we mentioned. And so maybe I would... No, there is your, a real uh, challenge yeah. Yeah, of yeah, yeah. the digital divide. Mm -mm -mm. So therefore, there is a digital divide yeah. on planet Earth. There are people who are a part of the digital economy or the digital paradigm. And there are lots of people who are out of the digital paradigm. And if you happen to be poor or underprivileged in, let's say, uh, large parts of the world which are developing, uh, it impacts the education of children, access to education, uh, access to uh, various other services, uh, primarily because they do not have the smartphones or the internet connectivity is not there. And so therefore, if you really want to move into a digital world, there is a lot of work which will have to be done in terms of upscaling the infrastructure in order to be able to involve everybody. And then there are going to be all kinds of regular, uh, regulatory issues around that. Let's not forget what you see in the digital world is only the flora and the fauna of the digital world. The underlying hardware mm. is still mm -hmm. controlled by sovereign states. And they have their own imperatives. Uh, the classical example is China, uh, which firewalled the internet and has turned it into a huge intranet. And so therefore, like we saw the rise of the internet during our lifetime, you may see the balkanization of the internet leading to its demise. You know, uh, it, it actually getting split up into uh, 
hegemonistic spheres or based upon religious and cultural identities. So there are a lot of challenges that we've not really thought through, uh, which require a huge amount of intellectual input uh, to be able to come up uh, with not solutions, but at least even policy frameworks, which then uh, governments and other policy makers can start dealing with. Yeah, exactly. And you mentioned the regulatory issues that are, I think, something at the, at the core of our, of our discussion. And maybe I will ask for the opinion of uh, Mrs. Uh, Jenny, Jenny Stefan, uh, since you have a, 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 a quite double uh, experience, both in the public uh, world as a former minister and in the industry as one of the executive of big industrial uh, company. Uh, what would be your, uh, your opinion on this uh, regulatory issue and the thing that we need to implement it? Uh, to, uh, to, to guide the innovation towards the future we want. Yes. Um, first, I, I'd like to react and uh, add my voices to uh, those uh, who spoke about uh, new devices, uh, new divides, new challenges. I think uh, in our uh, societies, for example, uh, there will be a new divide between people who are able to work from home and people who are not able to work from home, especially in the industry. So this is, you know, this change in the way of life of part of the population, part of the working population may create also a new divides and, and it, it calls for, for actions to make those industrial jobs much more attractive and to uh, push on uh, training, to uh, push on uh, the quality of uh, the conditions in which uh, the, the workers are, are working. So uh, this is also uh, why one point, I think, that will be on the agenda in, in the coming years. Uh, regarding the, the regulation and, and the, 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 the trust, the lack of trust we see, uh, in the population uh, when um, innovation emerges. I was quite struck to see in France the reactions to the 5G uh, network uh, implementation. Uh, I, uh, I understood that now uh, innovation needs to be uh, needs to be explained differently, needs to be prepared in the population differently, and needs to be regulated differently. So with a, a, a longer term vision, with a, an approach that mixes different um, scientific uh, knowledges, but also uh, sociological uh, approaches and experts to help bring, explain and adapt innovation to bring the best uh, to, to the citizen and to the countries. Excellent. Thank, thank you, uh, Mrs. Uh, Jenny Stefan. Maybe you, you mentioned a call for action. And I think that's, uh, that's um, a, a, key, a key turning point here since we have uh, Dr. Thelma Krug. Uh, and that's, I think, the IPCC report uh, that was uh, recently, uh, recently um, 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 Presented to the world, released exactly uh, was a call for action like no other that we've seen in the in the recent years. Uh, Dr. Thalmaku, do you think it is enough, and do you think that these results have been uh, understood enough by the policy the policymakers, the, the the big firms and the big uh, the big industries that are uh, quite uh, quite uh, prolific in terms of uh, of uh, GS emissions? Yeah, thanks, John. Uh well, if I take into account the responses that we have had in Brazil to the report itself, it has been great for industry, for businesses, for the civil society. Um, I would say less for government, but uh, uh, I think this is a, this is a process. But you know, uh, the sectors that I mentioned reacted very very strongly. So uh, so I think that yes, it's reaching their hearts. But Jen, if you allow me to um, to come to a previous question of yours, which I think uh, is important. When we started this meeting, and you asked for the definition of innovation, it, it was given as an idea turning to reality to meet the demand of the market. That really touched me a little bit. And I'll tell you, uh, right, uh, because I, and I'm also being, you know, supported by uh, the IPCC assessments. 
So, and, and then we say that technological innovation and the financial systems, they are highly responsive to short-term motivations, right? And normally responsive to market uh, demand. And this is also supported by the purchasing power. But the point that I want to make is that only indirectly it responds to the needs and particularly of those of the world's poor and operate within a time horizon that does not take into account the potential needs of future generation. So the point in that was really interesting because this week there was an advertisement on the television here in Brazil and they said that the, the mother of innovation is need. And, uh, you know, having assessed the IPCC on innovation and having come up with, you know, is this lack of looking not only at the market demands, the push for, you know, what the market is, uh, is moving us to, but the needs and the needs are differentiated. You know, me coming from a, you know, developing country, uh, also have to look from this point of view. Okay, the second point that I want to make is the role of international cooperation. And this is really a, a basic thing. Uh, so international cooperation on technology, including the technology transfer, when it doesn't have, have an, uh, uh, autonomously, right? It could be very helpful in, in creating innovation capabilities in all countries and allowing them to operate, to maintain, to adapt and regulate a portfolio of mitigation technologies. And, uh, and then IPCC really provides some case studies that shows that this is possible. There are challenges, yes, there are challenges, but there are opportunities as well. So I think that these two points, uh, innovation is, is really key, but also behind it, we still see inequalities uh, because not necessarily uh, the research and development potential or capability of the countries is leveled. And uh, so this is why I was mentioning international cooperation as being really key to leverage and reduce uh, these inequalities around the world. I hope this is helpful and sorry to coming back to some previous questions of yours. <laughs> no, that, that's a really good thing. That's, that's the, the problem with like physical presence here and remote intervention, of course. So thank you for coming back to this. And you, you mentioned international cooperation and technology transfer, and I think that's really something key in the, uh, in the innovation uh, framework. And we, we have seen a turning point with the COVID-19 pandemic, I think, uh, to that extent. Because um, do you think that technology transfer are still something that uh, are possible after what we've seen uh, after the pandemic. Uh, we might mention the example of vaccines, but on a more broader uh, framework, um, on a broader framework, um, are technological transfer possible in a society that asks for more sovereignty uh, is a turning point that might uh, stop or at least reduce the speed of innovation globally, worldwide. Um, what, what's your opinion on this, maybe, Professor Gibar? Well, I think technological transfer is still there. The question is really what is the framework for that? Uh, and what is because, of course, there is uh, issues of sovereignties between countries. There are issues of profitability for companies because most of the innovation is coming from companies, from their research, from their patents. And there is a no, even if the open source is developing, it remains a dominant system. And we've seen it with the, the, the vaccine and, and the pandemic, with all the, again, uh, the good and bad sides it may have. So it's really a matter of defining and having the appropriate framework for that, be it the free market with the patent regime, or having, in some cases, some exception to the general rules uh, of the uh, trade in, in the world. And, that, and then that's where the political dimension is coming, where the collaboration at the state or international level is coming, and maybe having some exclusion or area in which uh, the patent regime uh, has to be removed, uh, then it has to be done beforehand. Because if a company is investing a lot in developing some research and, and getting patent, either it has to know beforehand that it's going to be shared or it has to be compensated in some way. Otherwise, all the driver of the innovation in the private world of industry, which is whatever we think about it, the dominant driver of, 
at least technological innovation to stick to that, will, will be stopped. And, and so we have to be very careful on that to find the appropriate balance. And again, it's, it's really a matter of political will and political organization, I think. And, but political and politician may be better place than me to answer that. Hmm. No, I think you uh, make a very, very fair point. Uh, even if you look at uh, the entire vaccination paradigm, what do you see? You actually see a vaccine sharing arrangement. You don't see a vaccine manufacturing arrangement. Hmm. It's not as if uh, the patents have been, de or the, the research has been deposited in uh, an international depository which is accessible to everybody who then wants to manufacture vaccines domestically, uh, even with regard to uh, research around COVID-19, there is hardly any uh, uh, mandatory sharing of uh, data which is taking place even today. And that is primarily because uh, the companies which have invested billions and billions of dollars uh, into research and uh, developing those vaccines, they are answerable to their shareholders. They are answerable uh, to, uh, to their boards. And obviously, they are not in it for philanthropy. Uh, there is a definitive profit motive uh, which drives it. Now, therefore, under those circumstances, if let's suppose uh, in a once-in-a-century pandemic, uh, this research then has to be shared around all the sovereignties uh, or the Westphalian geographies around the world so that they can start manufacturing domestically rather than being dependent upon import from some country. Obviously, there will have to be an element of compensation uh, which will have to be built in. And those are the frameworks that we uh, really have not, uh, not, not studied because uh, eventually, the, the entire patent and intellectual property regimes have been pr primarily put in place uh, to ensure that uh, your intellectual property uh, is insulated and protected from any kind of piracy or uh, unwarranted use. That's why I was saying that, you know, these are the regulatory challenges, these are the uh, these are the thought challenges uh, mm. which we've not really applied our minds to even after going through 18 months of this pandemic which should have been a trigger for this kind of thinking. Mm. Of course, of course. And that, that might, um, might make, make me think about something that uh, one of you said uh, beforehand, that we need a lot of resources in order to, uh, to implement this innovation. And resources is something quite quite global that uh, falls under different uh, different regulatory pathways and so um, how can we uh, how can we measure this uh, this this need for resources uh, in order to have uh, an innovation that is sustainable for the industry and i would even open a, quite a pandora box with a, a specific question that would that might be uh, is the future of innovation in the industry low tech uh, because we, we are speaking about like uh, innovation quite in a, in a high level when we remain on the on the technological topic, uh, I think that uh, Thelma Krug uh, raised the point of innovation and inequalities. In the end, if we want innovation to be a social driver, does it need to be a uh, low tech in order to solve this problem of inequalities? If I may, well, I yeah. don't know. It all depends what we call low tech. What we need is low resource consuming innovation. Mm. But to consume less resource might be possibly more sophisticated in terms of innovation and in terms of technology. Mm. So it's not necessarily low tech. It's, it's low resource consumption innovation we need because we know the resources are finite. Mm. Even if we make progress in many things, unless we go to a fully circular economy, which I don't think, and even we will reach the limits of physics anyway. Uh, so we really have to think low resource consuming innovation and technologies. Yeah. yeah, maybe you wanted to react here. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah. I, I agree with, uh, with Dennis because on, on this topic, there are also a lot of, uh, um, a lot of uh, beliefs and, and stories. And it's also the, the, the answer to what was said about the 5G. The problem is innovation is not just a story. It's a, it's a tool 
to tell the story. But if you don't tell the story, if you don't tell where we are going, uh, what is the, the goal, where, what do we want to achieve, uh, there, 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 there can be this uh, misunderstanding about one specific technology or uh, the, the debate between low-tech and uh, high-tech. And as uh, Denis said, uh, a technology, uh, high technology is, is uh, designed to uh, use less and less resources. If you see an hard disk from 20 years ago, and if you see the equivalent today, you, you see how this, this um, uh, exponential, exponential curve of, um, uh, uh, I wanted to say, uh, uh, productivity, you know? And in the same time, we blame this productivity because now we emit more and more uh, GES. So, uh, I think the, the answer on that is not exclusive. We, we will need both uh, for different applications. Yeah, yeah, re really clear. And you, you mentioned that we, uh, we, we need to, uh, to have different stakeholders uh, participating in the, in the, the innovation uh, that, we, that we are uh, uh, constructing. And that, um, I think, is linked to what uh, Mrs. Um, um, Mrs. Jenny Stefan said uh, about, uh, about the 5G and the, the trust that we need to have uh, around innovation and the idea of technological uh, advance. Uh, what, what would be, according to you, the key features uh, to embark all stakeholders uh, in the stream, uh, from the NGOs to the companies to the citizens? Uh, to the international organizations such as the IPCC, uh, what are the, the key features in order to, uh, to, to create a common framework for this innovation? Um, so f first I'd like to come back to the, to the resource point. I think the natural resource impact is a, is a very important, interesting topic. Um, we, we have not uh, discussed, discussed yet the, 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 the question of transparency and disclosure from companies, and I think it is a very important uh, work stream for the already ongoing, and that is that is going to be deeper and deeper into these uh, these questions of, of resources. This is a this is a mean to um, open the eyes of companies and of their, their customers of their um, employees uh, about uh, real and concrete impacts. And I think it will be uh, play an important role. Um, these kind of measures are pushed through international relations. So I think this multilateral approach towards uh, resource consumption and global environmental matters, for example, are very important. I'm an optimist because I was part of um, the, the, the uh, Montreal Protocol work, you know, uh, about the ozone layer, and this was uh, uh, one uh, significant achievement for the international community. I think that also the Paris Agreement, the, the, the COP21 Agreement, is a very positive sign that we have entered a new era of international relations that where governments and NGOs are able to embark um, company, industrial companies and to uh, obtain uh, significant commitments. So um, um, my feeling is that there are new dialogues, new ways uh, that have been found, that have been explored and that uh, we should continue to develop. Exactly. Yeah. That's a very important point you, you, you are mentioning regarding the, the role and the accountability and the responsibility of the corporate world and the company. And I think we are, we are seeing moves in the, in the right direction regarding more transparency, more commitment from the, the company. In France, we had some major changes that are coming with a, a new law which is called Lou Loi Pact mm -hmm. and the uh, raison d'être, I don't know how to translate that in, in English, that uh, some companies are taking, as well as the, the fact that they are becoming mission company. Again, it might be difficult to translate in English, but with the mission company status, what is important is that other stakeholders may have a word to say and are able to check what are the commitments and that the commitment of the company are fulfilled. Because quite often we say that, and we, we may have been talking about greenwashing or social washing, company may claim they're taking care of environment or social impact of what they're doing, but the real question is to be able to check 
And that is, well, it's not perfect, but I think we're seeing a move, at least in, uh, in certain countries like France, in the right direction. Of course, it's moving too slow, uh, and, uh, and, the, and the scope is not broad enough, but at least it's those first steps. Mm. And it, it looks like what you said about innovation, because the raison d'être, the reason to be your mission company, it's, first of all, it's a, it's a phrase, it's, it's a story, it's a storyline about what you are uh, here for. Uh, what are you? Why are you doing your business for? Uh, so it's a storyline looking in the future, and you try to transform this storyline into reality. Exactly the definition you gave to um, innovation at, at the first place. Mm. And I think that's a, that's a great thing that you mentioned, both of you, the, account, the accountability of companies, just as uh, Mrs. Jenny Stefan um, um, mentioned, because. Um, the underlying thing is that we, we need to measure this social impact and to have indicators, uh, quite, quite um, objective things uh, to rely on. Um, and I, I might ask um, Dr. Thelma Krug, uh, is, is the role of the IPCC to uh, not only to explain and to raise awareness about uh, this, uh, this climate crisis, but also to give uh, indicators, to give, uh, to give uh, tools in order to follow this uh, accountability of companies uh, in the end? Well, th thanks for the question, Jean uh, Baptiste. And uh, yeah, the role of IPCC is really to bring uh, uh, an assessment of the, the, the all the literature around the world on issues, and it concentrates a lot on all sectors. So you see a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, assessments done for industry, and now we are talking also about industrial transformation that has been mentioned here as well. Uh, but not only it's uh, on all sectors energy you know system transformation agriculture land use the waste sector so we are talking about all these changes so uh, the role of ipcc is, is then to bring the uh, let's say the state of the art on the knowledge uh, on on these issues and not that they are easy and i think that the point of the ipcc is also to find the opportunities and complexities uh, to, to achieve the system transformations that we are looking for. But also in the mitigation, uh, the mitigation report that comes from uh, working group three of the IPCC, you know, comes with a lot of uh, social environmental issues related to mitigation. And obviously industry has a whole chapter into it. And obviously innovation not comes into that specifically. Innovation comes everywhere including in the 1.5 special report. But Jean-Baptiste, do you allow me to comment on something that was said before, just to challenge a little bit? There's no problem with this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we are talking about technology trends. And this is really a, a key issue. So if I pick up something from the IPCC here that says that across all industrial sectors, the development and deployment of innovative technologies, business models, policy approaches at scale will be essential in accelerating process, progress with meeting both the economic and social development goals, as well as low emissions. So we, if we are looking this holistically, worldwide, because when we are saying that this uh, climate change is a global problem, so uh, it's a global issue, then we are talking about the planet as a whole. And I already talked about these different capacities, in particular research and development, not only because of the capacity, uh, technical, academic, let's say capacity, but institutional as well. How can the government support those kind of activities that would, you know, somehow allow all the countries to be uh, engaged into this? So if we are looking uh, at a, a, a next zero CO2 world globally, and that's the key, globally, doesn't it really entails a different relation of uh, innovation development, technology transfer, to allow in particular developing countries to, to change potentially their path towards development, trying to achieve sustainable development, 
the sustainable development goals. So I think that I don't have the answer, obviously, but uh, I thought that the discussion on technology transfer, shouldn't it be an innovation on technology transfer in the way we, we, we see it and how difficult it has been, considering how much we need to do globally? So that is, uh, that is uh, you know, in the air, and possibly it would be very nice to, to see uh, the responses. So also, uh, in, in a sense, Jean-Pascal, I was looking at barriers for innovation. Innovation is not something that, you know, you just develop and, and implement. You may have, and, and this is as well, uh, barriers that, uh, that are, uh, are locally specific. So you may have institutional barriers, you may have environmental barriers, you may have social cultural barriers. And so this is, is something that uh, also is interesting to see that it's different in every place, depending on where you are. So I, I think that innovation is really a challenge from many points of view. I very, like, I very much appreciate it and IPCC does recognize that in the report that we are not talking only about technological innovation. We are talking about social innovation. We are talking about it's the institutional innovation. We are talking in so many innovations that come along with the technological innovation that is really uh, quite interesting to see that how, how fast are we going to be able to build these innovations in all these uh, elements that eventually will lead us to have a more equitable uh, world. Of course, and that's interesting to hear about this uh, this social innovation. That was, I, I think, a key point that I I'd I like to uh, to mention, and uh, more especially the, the education, the skills that we need for this innovation. I think uh, maybe Mr. Mr. Tiwari, I might have your uh, your um, your um, opinion on this. Uh, innovation is also uh, to educate the population uh, from a knowledge point of view. The IPCC is doing is doing this, but also to educate about new skills to implement. Uh, to implement innovation, because innovation needs new skills uh, from a social point of view, from a technological point of view. And do you think that is something that we might achieve globally? Uh, and what are the levers that we might use to, uh, to achieve this global education of the, the world population? Now, before I answer your question, let me respond to something which was said, and I think that's really thought-provoking. Yeah, of course. That is, uh, government uh, should support slash lead innovation. And I was just trying to uh, recall, when was it the last time <laughs> that governments were actually involved in uh, any innovation? And uh, I think the only time that governments were a part and parcel of destructive innovation was during the Second World War, which culminated with the Manhattan Project and uh, uh, the rest is history. Uh, even uh, when the world was divided into uh, two power blocks, how much innovation did you see come out of the command economy, Soviet Union uh, led uh, uh, economic uh, political model? The space race. Uh, the space race. Yeah. The space race yeah. was so, a totally so, political so, so, project. So, so, so essentially, essentially, yeah. Uh, and I don't think that was really for any larger material good. It was almost a precursor to the weaponization of outer space. Hmm. So, 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 so therefore, uh, you know, the fact is that innovation is going to be private-led, private-driven, and, uh, and, 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 and therefore you really need to find the frameworks of being able to support it. Uh, and, and, and if, let's suppose, you are going to de hoss the profit, profit motive from it, I don't think that is really doing uh, yeoman service to the cause of innovation, <laughs> if I might, uh, uh, might put it in that manner. Coming to your question with regard to the ecosystem around e uh, innovation, the, the, the uh, educational, technological, uh, social uh, transformations which have to be made. You know, one must keep in mind that uh, the planet is uh, divided into Westphalian entities, and each of them is at a different stage of development. Mm. While 
uh, a number of developing countries, including India, in the climate change debate have moved from the separated, separate but differentiated responsibilities uh, to uh, voluntarily, uh, voluntary goals, and you know, now we are talking about net zero. Uh, but the fact remains that, uh, and I'm not uh, uh, doing any victim shaming or finger pointing, but the fact remains that uh, the more developed part of the world uh, has a larger responsibility uh, in order to both mitigate the uh, impact of climate change and possibly create those frameworks where this technology transfer actually starts taking place. Because given the manner in which the entire legal, regulatory, uh, intellectual property, patents regime is structured, and after the Washington consensus, when the new liberal economic order held the field, you essentially made everybody adapt or adopt that particular template uh, till the time you don't have a, a fundamental reconfiguration of all these regimes, you are not going to really see that technology transfer take place. Mm. Mm, very, very interesting. Uh, there is a lot of uh, things here, I think, that are quite, quite interesting. Yeah, um, you wanted to no, we, we may discuss yeah. a lot the role of the state yeah. in innovation, and uh, even including in the technological product and services innovation in many parts of across countries, the role. And even in France, I think we still add some example post-World War II, uh, where there were some major technological innovations that were state-driven. But that, that's not really the point. I think what is most important today is the way in which the state can be pushing and supporting innovation in various ways. That's a real, uh, the, the, the real challenge. And there are, of course, the classical ways, either regulation in one way or another. There are all the fiscal and the financial incentive that can be given. And I think there is a third mission of the state in, in many countries, which is education. And again, training people for education as well. And education can have a, a lot of dimension. It's, of course, the education to help people design and be innovative uh, and mastering some technologies. But not only, again, don't forget what we said at the beginning, innovation is not only technological. Mm -hmm. So measuring, understanding, and be able to measure and anticipate the impact and identifying, and not maybe only the market, but to get back to the point that what meant by sale mother, the, the, the needs as well, is also something you have to, to, to be educated to. And if we just refer to climate change, which is a big issue of the day in our discussion, I think we need to be able to train and educate all the people uh, regarding what it is, what are the implications. And if I take my hat as the chairman of the Committee for Sustainable Development and Corporate Responsibility from the French conference, the Grandes Écoles, the higher education institution in France. I think we cannot imagine today that we have a student graduating from our higher uh, education institution that's not, not fully aware of what the uh, uh, ecological crisis and the needed ecological transition is. Mm -hmm. And not only be just given some clue, but really understanding all the impact, the decision, and the actions they are going to take into the company. And there are going to be people at high position in the companies, not with higher impact that on average. So they have really to be educated on that, to understand all this impact and to be able to guide the, the company in the right direction in that. And to go for the good innovation and go, the, go for the best decision, taking into account not only the P&L and the financial result of the company, but having the broader scope, which again leads us to a key question, which is measuring the impact in a global dimension and not only the financial one. And we are still looking for what are the key indicators to measure that. And if we just take, a, take the example, and it's quite complex, if we just take the example of looking at a life cycle analysis of a product, there are 12 or 13 dimensions. How we combine that to make a decision. And if you add that, and that's only the environmental, if we add the social impact and the economical impact, it makes decisions very tough to, to be made. But we need to train our people to, to understand this complexity and to be prepared to face it. Mm -hmm. okay. That's also where yeah. the Sustainable Development Goals are also a framework and a lot of uh, indicators that can help all the states and all the companies and all the citizens to have a common uh, roadmap 
for this uh, innovation. I think also it's one of the of the the key the, the key um, issues of, of, of these uh, goals, and it can be also be used to to that. Uh, uh, do we uh, um, and does does the the, the, the the social issues are um, well addressed, the equal gender equality, and so on, and it can be also be this framework for innovation. Mm, and that's something really interesting. I think we, we talked about like the state responsibility, the need for educated, uh, educated people and executives. Uh, and uh, I would have a, a question uh, for Mrs. Jenny Stefan uh, remotely. Um, would be the, the COVID would the COVID nineteen um, crisis a catalyst for this? Because we've seen like states that um, organize their their economic plans in order to 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 bounce back after this pandemic by uh, selecting key features and key. Uh, topics, key fields in which we should invest and invest in a, in a broad sense. I, I mean by this financially, but also socially. And do you think that this pandemic will be a, a catalyst for this innovation uh, towards the future we want? Um, first, I would say that uh, gov governments have already played a, a significant role, especially in Europe, to shape uh, the path to uh, 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 less environment, uh, less environment impact by uh, by industries, uh, by uh, creating the, the carbon markets, for example, of course, uh, tax uh, uh, tax uh, policies that are uh, quite important for uh, industrial and uh, energetic uh, policies. So it's uh, it's uh, already, I mean, uh, very high on the agenda. Of, of the government. May, maybe the COVID crisis has uh, created an expectation for governments to, to channel their resources because huge resources have been deployed. And um, the, 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 uh, the population is expecting the government to be wise in the way it, they are going to use these, uh, these youth resources because all these investments will shape the, the future and the future of societies, the future of uh, economic markets. So, um, yes, I think uh, COVID is accelerating uh, the, the consciousness about the responsibility of government in the way they channel resources and in the way they implement regulation. Very clear, thank you. Um, so maybe since we have uh, uh, about 20, 25 minutes uh, uh, remaining in our uh, round table, I might uh, take the questions from the audience since we received uh, uh, quite, a, quite a lot. Uh, so the, the first one, uh, I think that is rather interesting since we uh, were talking about the uh, the state responsibility will be uh, taking into account what was said uh, how can we encourage developing countries to innovate or transform their industries in pursuit of the ecological transition when they have other structural problems that need to be solved um, so i think that's that's quite interesting uh, the the underlying idea would be to to rank these structural problems and structural uh, um, priorities but uh, uh, how would you react uh, to this so since we're talking about uh, developing countries and as you mentioned uh, you mentioned your your own example maybe uh, mr tewar you would like to uh, to answer to this <coughs> Look, I think... Uh, Do not forget your oh, microphone. Sorry. Uh, look, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah. look, I think uh, there is a, a fundamental challenge uh, and the developing world, quote, unquote, mm -hmm. uh, is not on the same page because there are certain countries which are more susceptible to climate change or the implications of climate change where I think the urgency <clears throat> of trying to combat and surmount it uh, is uh, much greater. For example, if you were to look at South Asia, Maldives uh, is a country where uh, the challenge of uh, global warming uh, is very real. Uh, Bangladesh is another uh, country where uh, the challenge of global warming uh, essentially means uh, the loss of a lot of fertile... Uh, land which they use for irrigation, etc. But uh, that is not 
uh, uniformly there across the world. And I think uh, primarily because uh, as, uh, if I can refer to uh, you as professor, if you do not mind, but as you very rightly pointed out, uh, I don't think that we've been able to sensitize uh, our uh, policy makers or even uh, the people who are going through school and college uh, about the implications of climate change. I mean, if you were to rewind back to the Earth Summit in Rio in 1992, and I was there in Rio in 1992, I used to head an organization called the International Union of Students, and we had gone to the uh, Rio summit. And from 1992 till uh, 2021, uh, while there has been uh, forward movement uh, from uh, Copenhagen to Paris and et cetera, et cetera. But I don't think it's really percolated uh, very much down. Number two, uh, there are also legacy issues. Now, there is a certain amount of equipment that you can re-engineer. Uh, you can possibly even add uh, climate mitigation uh, uh, technology to it. Uh, but there are large number of legacy plants, uh, which you would just need to be mothballed. And that uh, involves, A, a huge amount of investment, and more importantly, it involves a complete change in mindset. So, so, so therefore, are countries willing to move from hydrocarbons uh, to renewables, skipping over intermedi intermediates? Now, these are policy questions which I don't think have been really debated and answered. Until mm -hmm. the time, uh, you do not have a substantive part of the world, notwithstanding whatever they may have said in Paris, uh, really on the same page, uh, trying to implement things on the ground, I'm afraid we are a still, still a long way uh, from the objectives that we've set out for ourselves. Mm. Yeah, of course. And that, that would maybe be a link to the second question that we received from the audience. Um, is, I quote also, technological, unquote, ecology desirable, necessary? Um, so maybe on the necessary part, since you said that we, we might need this technology in order to meet the SDG goals, um, I think that the, the underlying idea is, here is to talk about uh, carbon capture technologies, um, I don't know, digitization that might, um, that might reduce the consumption of resources and all these, these things. So probably these uh, this people from the audience is, uh, is wondering, uh, is this thing necessary or should we just... Um, it here and just not try to consume these, uh, these, uh, these potential resources? What, whatever is the answer, uh, you can't impose that. It no. comes from the people, from, from the market. And so uh, it, the, the, the question of necessary, you can tell it if you're uh, in a dictatorship and you can push button and say, from now the people don't have the right to go to the internet. And we have some countries who, who can try these kind of things. We can't. Uh, so it means that uh, it's uh, another kind of stories and we have several stories in the same time. And in time, we see which are working and which are not working. Mm -hmm. And uh, generally, it comes from the usage from the people. For instance, there is uh, really an under-the-radar uh, technology based on, tr maybe it's the technology of trust that we call blockchain, uh, with a lot of um, excess and excess of, uh, of uh, energy consumption because it's uh, like a, a, a very young technology and uh, it's like the, the, the coal, coal mine of this uh, new revolution and, mm. uh, and they call that mining, for, for instance. Mm. Uh, it doesn't come from a state, it doesn't come from a particular, um, a particular company. It's like, like an organic, uh, organic um, creation that, uh, that is decentralized. And that comes with a lot of new uh, potentials and issue and value creations. And so uh, we can look at this uh, expansion because it's uh, totally crazy those days. And it, it comes exactly at the same moment where we have the IPCC report. And we, we can look at both and see how this can serve this. 
Mm. You can't, um, of course, you can have regulation and you can, you, you can uh, make laws about that, but it goes faster. And if in this time there can be a solution to address the, the problem we just talked about, it can be very, very uh, quick. It can be much more quicker than uh, a, um, a culture, uh, a cultural, uh, not a cultural change, because this is a cultural change, but much more uh, quicker than an institutional change. It's not a government or something that you, you, you need uh, years to negotiate. It comes from the audience and can be very, very quick. And for instance, we have already a lot of new uh, decentralized systems that are based on no consumption and no uh, emission. Or DAO, you know, the, this decentralized system based on blockchain that are specifically designed to address the climate change. Um, at the COP26, there will be also uh, NFT uh, production of a new collection, especially based on uh, com uh, combat on climate change. And it, this was totally under the radar, like one or two years ago. So uh, this is also what, what is uh, 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 thrilling with innovation, is that you don't necessarily know where it will come from. It was not decided by a state, it was not decided by a single company, but this is something that people needed. And this is why it exists. And we have to measure the, the impact, the negative and the positive impact, and do whatever we, we can for that the positive impact are much higher than the negative ones. I think if I refer back to the question of ecological technologies and are they necessary or mandatory, my feeling, my personal belief, is that technological uh, solution will not solve the problem. I, I, let me explain it. The problem is, on one end, reducing climate change. The second thing is mitigating and adapting to it. Of course, technological solution will help in many respects to that. But it, it will be not enough. And I think the, the real thing is we have to change the model. We have to change the business model. We have to change the, the model of consumption and production globally, which means that we have to globally consume less. And then we re come to the question of how we share this consumption between all the people and all the countries. And of course, the balance will be different uh, according to the country, which means that we really have to change the model within 20 or well, we have the agenda 2030, or we're talking with the IPCC report 2050. Uh, that's, that's a time frame in which we have to change. And whatever technology, technological path we, we, we may see, it will not be enough to, meet the, the, to reach the target. So it's really a deeper change, and we need innovation, which is not uh, technological innovation, which is social, uh, eco economical uh, process, uh, governance, business model innovation, to, 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 to to f meet and tackle this big challenge we are facing. Mm. Re re really clear. And, and you, you spoke about an, an ambitious time frame that would be uh, this 10 years, 20 years time frame. Um, we, we, uh, we mentioned a lot of time during this, uh, this, uh, this talk the, uh, the regulatory framework in order to help for this, uh, this innovation to be, uh, to be of help in this transition. And um, do, do, I, I would ask a question. Um, is, is, the te is technology and innovation in a broader sense going fast? Uh, too fast in the end for regulation. We mentioned, I think that you mentioned, Mr. Tiwari, uh, the uh, space race. That is, I think, an interesting, uh, an interesting example. Uh, we we were quite surprised, uh, surprised. I think that people that were that were not aware of the space uh, industry were surprised to see that in such a short time frame, we were able to send uh, to send kilograms of equipment in the in in outer space for uh, not that much money uh, compared to what it was, uh, what were the costs during the, the years before. And regulation uh, did not follow. We have like satellite constellations, uh, different actors that are trying to, uh, to enter this crowded space. And so that's an example between, like, uh, among others. But do you think that regulation will always uh, lag behind uh, innovation? And so uh, in the end, regulation is not something that we should rely on uh, to, to frame. Uh, well, that's a given. Yeah. Uh, regulation has and will continue to lag behind innovation mm. because uh, the march of technology is far, far quicker and swifter than the uh, human endeavor 
to capture it in some kind of a regulatory framework. But does, that does not mean that a, regulator, uh, a, re a regulatory framework is not uh, imperative. Uh, for example, you know, you talked about space. Now, uh, the latest thing which I'm hearing is that uh, companies actually want to send satellites in bursts, small satellites, mm -hmm. into, yeah. into, into, into low orbit. Mm -hmm. And so essentially, if you're going to, let's say, have hundreds of these pods floating around, look at the kind of debris that you are going to ultimately be accumulating. You mm -hmm. know, outer space is already polluted with the satellite march. And so therefore, under those circumstances, if you are going to allow now these little pods to be uh, thrown all over uh, the low orbit uh, outer space, uh, you are uh, in fact creating a more humongous problem uh, than even climate change with somebody at some point in time or another IPCC will have to address. So, 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 so therefore, but if you have regulation in place uh, today, which is able to uh, I'm not saying proscribe, but at least systematize this activity. Mm -hmm. I think it would make uh, life much simpler. See, another example, which is, of course, in a different domain altogether. Uh, you've had the uh, march of uh, the entire uh, cyber revolution. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the entire cyber domain has got completely weaponized. Uh, so, therefore, there is weaponization of uh, different kinds. You have the social weaponization of tro trolls and bots yeah. and, fake you know, news. disinformation and fake news, etc. Mm -hmm. And then you have the more serious kind of weaponization uh, with the ability of a cyber attack to uh, play havoc with your electricity grids, your nuclear power plants, or simply uh, drones attacking oil refineries. So, oh. so, so the question would be that doesn't this require some kind of a regulatory framework? Doesn't mm. it require some kind of uh, uh, some kind of agreed rules of engagement to be put in place? Uh, and that's a bus which we have missed in the case of the internet. Now, conversations around agreed rules of engagement in the virtual civilization have been going on for the last two decades. And unfortunately, the absolutists, the, the advocates of free speech, uh, are the ones who have stymied it. And I think they are their own worst enemies. Because the, 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 the trajectory uh, which unfortunately it has taken is that this entire uh, public good that we created for the benefit of mankind, or of humankind, is now being left uh, to sovereign states to regulate at will. I mean, if you look at the uh, data protection regimes which are being uh, put in place, the, uh, the EU GDPR uh, is now being uh, copied in a far, far more virulent form by different uh, countries around the world. So, 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 therefore, I think the time has come uh, for people uh, because uh, innovation is now predictable, uh, to, mm. you know, to some extent, and if there is more transparency, you would know what is, let's say, happening in different fields, especially the sunrise fields of biotechnology, artificial intelligence, yeah, I, mm. you know, robotics, etc. And, and you require super specialized people who mm. need to look at uh, all these areas yeah, from a regulatory perspective and, and very early on. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I think mm. you, you need research, yeah. academics and faculty yeah. to work yeah. on that, yeah. not only on the technological mm. aspect again, but all the other social, regulatory, ethical aspect. Uh, it's very important. And that this work from, the, uh, from uh, faculty people, from academic people, and we in our school and you know, others are doing work on, on that, are very important to shed light on, on, on this issue and help the, the regulatory work because it's quite complex and, and it's moving very fast. So we really need, again, education and, and research. And education is based on research. 
<laughs> and also raise the ambition because the emergency is so huge that, you know, for instance, a company like uh, Microsoft, like all the companies, they have a goal to uh, zero net emission. But the, the goal after that for 2050 is to uh, get back the, the carbon in the atmosphere that they produce since the creation of the company in 75. It means it's another kind of race. It's the regenerative uh, race, you know, the, the regenerative economy. That's, uh, for, and, and I'm not the only one to, to say that, but that will be the next step after sustainable development because mm. we failed in the sustainable development. We should have done that 30 years ago. And now uh, the problem is so huge that we have to accelerate and, and put the regeneration into all the innovation um, uh, blueprints. Mm, re really clear and really interesting. I think you, you mentioned the, uh, the academic research and that's, uh, that's I think an occasion to ask for a Selma Krug uh, uh, reaction to this. Uh, as, as a member of, as, as a vice chairman of the IPCC of course, but also as a, as a scientist, um, wh what would be to you the key features in order to uh, shed as you said, shed lights more efficiently on academic research and to implement this uh, in, a, in, a, in a broader ecosystem that would include NGOs, uh, state and, uh, and uh, all stakeholders. Yeah, thanks for the question, Jan, and it's really interesting because, you know, in the, in the IPCC reports, we, the, you know, because as I said, we assess the literature worldwide, uh, to, to have the reports and the findings uh, and to see the evidence on those uh, articles and also to see the consistency of the results among these, uh, these publications. Uh, so we have been uh, stimulating developing countries for which the production, academic production, is not as robust as you have in developed countries. So in a sense, this is being reduced uh, potentially because there are more opportunities now than we had in the past. And moreover, you see an increasingly number of uh, developing countries participants uh, in, the, in the assessments of the IPCC, in the reports of the IPCC. Obviously, we always look for geographical balance exactly to avoid to have a biased vision uh, and to promote uh, the opportunity to have this balanced literature coming from, from all over the world. So this per se, you know, IPCC has been really pushing the world in outreach events, the importance of publications, the, the importance of the academic world. But beyond that, it is not only academics, we are also pushed to have, uh, you know, publications coming from industry where they are relevant, publications coming from governments where they are relevant, and also from academic institutions, for instance, in PhD thesis or so on, to be used as part of, um, of the assessment of the IPCC. So I think uh, we see this as increasingly uh, being improved. In the past, it was highlighted as, you know, we don't have as many publications from developing countries to, you know, to, 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 to give the robust uh, evidence from coming from those countries. But now this is really improving. Um, yeah, so, uh, uh, Jean, if I may, if I may say uh, something as well regarding uh, the, the transformations that we need, it is not only in industry. Uh, it was interesting that in the 1.5 special report of the IPCC, uh, there was a, a phrase that said, reaching the, limiting the, the global warming to 1.5 is not impossible, but it, it will require transformation. It will require changes in all sectors of society that is unprecedented in the history. So uh, when we are talking today about innovation, talking about industry, we are talking about a whole suite of transformations uh, that will lead to these uh, to these uh, the huge changes that we need to limit global warming. And that is, uh, uh, comes to the institutional changes. We have mentioned social changes, behavior changes. So all these uh, put together to really lead us to a world where we can see, uh, you know, um, the, the, the global warming being limited to a, to a level that 
restricts the, the impacts in all, all, uh, all systems, natural systems, human systems, and so on. Yeah, re really clear. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Salma Krug. Maybe I, I'd like to finish, since we have uh, uh, several minutes, uh, five minutes left, on, on a, a quite... Um, quite tricky topic that would be uh, a social change, uh, social innovation, since we mentioned during the whole topic that it was not only technology uh, behind the word innovation, um, which is Uberization. Um, the fact that uh, because of technology, digitization mainly, companies are uh, transforming their business models. That's something that we mentioned uh, uh, several, several, uh, several points during this, uh, this talk. And uh, that uh, states are also reacting to this by, impl by implementing new regulation, giving new status to these workers. And that's a social innovation. I think that is, quite, uh, that is a key to understand uh, what should drive uh, innovation towards the future we want. Maybe I'll give the floor to, uh, to Delphine, Jenny, Stefan on that point uh, before coming back to, to you here in Paris. Uh, do you think that Uberization is a, a, a benchmark of an innovation um, uh, interesting towards the future we want from a regulatory point of view, from uh, a link between the state and the companies? Uh, what, what is your opinion about this? I think you, you pick the example that is strikingly um, illustrating what has been said before, which is that uh, today's innovation is so fast that uh, it is hard for regulation to keep up with a, with a reason. So um, I, um, I, I think this is a, a key example and uh, this is also an example of how something can happen in worldwide, in a worldwide setting with uh, all countries learning from each other's um, and uh, a, a kind of um, intelligent framework that is not yet fully shaped and the um, device can be imagined uh, by experiments and by looking at what others do. So we see uh, uh, cities reacting, we see countries reacting, we see companies adopting a uh, code of conducts uh, good practices in terms of uh, social uh, relationships with, with these workers. So I think we, we really need to deploy everything to build on this uh, multilateral and common intelligence. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mrs. Uh, Jenny Stefan. I think that's that's uh, that's something uh, uh, good to conclude with. Today, we need to deploy everything that we have. We talked about uh, regulation, we talked about education, we talked about intergovernmental uh, um, uh, connection, tr technology transfer, and I think that's uh, that's the the word that would, should sum up all that we said here. It's it's cohesion or or interconnection. Uh, between different environments, we mentioned the NGOs, uh, the schools, uh, the educational world, the firms, and uh, that's why we have like this, uh, this, uh, um, these SDGs that should uh, that should lead us towards uh, an innovation for the future we want. So I'd like to to thank you for being part uh, for taking part of this uh, on this panel, uh, the three of you here in Paris, and uh, Mrs. Krug and Mrs. Jenny Stefan uh, remotely, and uh, and uh, thank you for all your insights and stay with us for the end of this. Uh, fourth day of the uh, sustainable uh, meeting with the uh, uh, school RD meeting.